but it was okay here we go screen it's all right um, because i am gonna do a couple of uh are you seeing the full screen uh full screen power version of the powerpoint here i am seeing um for the presenter view no i'm seeing your um i am seeing your slide but i'm seeing next slide too so i'm seeing the uh I'm seeing the view you want for you, but not for the public. Hello, as people filter in. Hey, everyone. We're still fixing a few technical things. So please have patience. All right, let me just change my Zoom share. I apologize. No worries. Are you seeing the full screen now? Yes, we're seeing okay. the full screen now. OK, so, good. Great. Um, I'm going to give it a few minutes. Um, welcome to attendees. I'm going to give it a few minutes as um, folks arrive because I know it's the middle of the semester, midterm time, super, super busy time. I think we have Bruce with us now. There we go. I gotta move the video to my main screen too, so I'm not looking sideways at people. <laughs> That's right. I'm uh, one of those people whose desk looks like one of those uh, uh, one of those hacker movies. You know, there's like a console on one screen. <laughs> one screen. <laughs> well, that's what you are. <laughs> You're the, the hacker of history of technology. With a, with a desktop background of HAL 9000. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Hey, um, Bruce, hello. hello. So good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry, I'm sorry I'm late. My class. You know, we were doing the atomic bomb, so it always runs over. Ooh, good times. I mean, the class. <laughs> <laughs> so, Felipe, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm coming coming to you guys from my home office lab today here because there's some Ida related construction happening in my uh, right near my office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but at least they finished all the roofing around me here, so it's actually quieter here today than. And on campus, finally got my garbage picked up. That was amazing. oh wow! Yeah. yeah, I'd heard that was kind of a uh, an issue. Yeah, definitely. Well, should we um, should we go ahead and get started? I'm I'm really glad to have you here, Felipe. Um, it's great to have you, quote unquote, back. <laughs> I wish you were actually here in Austin. Um, I don't know if, uh, how about Bruce, I just introduced the HPS colloquium and sure. then um, you can introduce Felipe? Sure. Uh, great. Okay. Um, we'll just leave your first slide up there, Felipe. Um, uh, well, welcome. I know uh, most of you attending are old timers, but I'll just say uh, for anybody who might be um, joining us for the first time, this is the History and Philosophy of Science colloquium. In the before times, we met almost every Friday at noon in Wagner Hall and um, had a nice informal uh, kind of, we can workshop, work in progress, um, hear new work that people across uh, campus and then outside and returning visitors have to share in history of science, technology, medicine, um, and related fields. Um, uh, of course, since last year, we've been on uh, we've been doing this on Zoom and slightly less frequently since Zoom kind of lowers the tolerance for frequent meetings, but we do hope to be back in person um, as soon as possible. This semester will be continuing to be uh, uh, online on Zoom. You can see the schedule uh, either at our website, which I'll put in the chat, um, or on the History Department's events page. You can um, join for future events. Uh, uh, there, sign up for the next few. And this semester, Bruce and I decided to organize the talks to be a celebration of our alumni because we have um, many UT uh, alumni in the fields of history of science, technology, medicine. Um, and so we want to celebrate that this, this semester. But I'll turn it over to Bruce to introduce our speaker for today. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Um, we're very happy to welcome uh, Felipe Cruz. Um, 
who was, of course, a graduate student here. Uh, Seth Garfield and I uh, supervised his very good dissertation on the history of aviation in uh, in Brazil and uh, the uh, uh, the the role that aviation played in uh, sort of the frontiers of Brazil. Well, uh, and now, of course, Felipe teaches at uh, Tulane University in uh, in New Orleans, and um, and I understand Felipe has uh, the the book is uh, in process, right? Next year. Next year. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Congrats. Uh, and Philippe, I, one other thing to mention is Felipe has uh, been very active for a long time in digital humanities uh, and does some, done some amazing projects and work on uh, uh, tools and methods for uh, digital humanities. Well, today he'll be talking about something that's really, um, I know, close to his heart and goes back to his, uh, his master's uh, uh, degree on uh, hot air balloons in Brazil. Uh, excellent paper on the topic that was in technology and culture a while back. Um, not too long, not too far back, really. Um, and, uh, and an excellent film, too, that Felipe made uh, about this. So with that, we'll turn it over to Felipe to talk about hacking airspace, the insurgent technology of Brazil's hot air balloons. Hey, everyone. Welcome and thank you for having me. Uh, as as uh, Professor Han noted, I'm, you know, always, always happy to talk about the balloons. Uh, <laughs> So, and I'm very happy to be back, even if virtually. Hopefully, uh, next couple of years, I'll, I'll uh, be back in Austin. Um, so, this is, um, well, I think I'll uh, start actually by uh, giving a feeling of what a Sunday, winter Sunday morning in uh, outside of the cities of Rio and Sao Paulo in Brazil might sound or look like. And I hope, I know there's some issues with Zoom sharing the sound, but I'm just gonna share, share a video clip here of a Sunday morning balloon. I don't know if you guys can hear the, uh, the sound. I'm not hearing the sound, but. Well, it's loud. <laughs> we can imagine it from the explosion. But... <laughs> and lots of excited people. Uh, uh yelling here but uh i think i can reshare with the uh, sound and video clip there we go yes hearing it now <laughs> so, the nocturnal version of this um Right here, let me pull it up. general feeling there um let me uh bring up up oh, bring up my zoom back here so i can uh see you guys so as you can tell these are uh, uh can be quite the event and if you grew up uh like me in the 90s in sao paulo especially around the kind of what in uh what in in brazil they're called the periphery of the city um in uh, both rio and sao paulo you this would be almost every sunday morning you'd see several of these go up right there'll be at least thousands uh, uh, a year um uh, being launched around the city uh and they are a long-standing practice but in their modern form that i'll show you here since the mid 20th century um that's what i'll be talking about today they are I mean, they range in various types of uh, artistic themes, the types of uh, uh, their shapes, their um, the payload they carry, um, as well as 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 uh, varying sizes. I mean, there's some record-setting ones that are over 200 feet tall. 
Uh, and they are, you know, part of this like very, very intense, dedicated subculture of the balloonists that practice this uh, and actually in organized uniformed teams that, uh, that collect dues and have workshops that they, you know, will spend often for a bigger project, something like a year preparing a balloon for a launch, right? And show you a couple of the different kinds here. You saw some fireworks ones there. Those are, um, the other main type of balloon we have is the ones that carry banners. You see one that kind of integrates its big paper banner here uh, to the balloon itself, uh, carrying the torch. And perhaps these most impressive ones are the ones that carry these light panels, right? They're like these banners um, uh, for uh, nighttime balloons that consist of thousands of little paper uh, paper lanterns, each with a candle. Uh, when I was doing a field work for this, I actually watched one uh, rise. There was um, 10,000 lanterns uh, that formed a very realistic image of the, of the Virgin Mary. Um, so these are, you know, have grown very complex over the years, but there's one thing that I should say they all share no matter what, until very recently at least, is that they're always made of paper and they're always propelled by fire, okay, by these big torches. And I'll show some of the manufacturing kind of process here that they, uh, that they go through. Um, and this is considered to be a, a, um, like a firm tenet of the balloonists here, that this is kind of the soul. Paper and fire are the soul of the balloon as one, one of my kind of informants in field work. Uh, um, uh, said, right? So they'll go through all sorts of kind of technical innovations to make them more complex, carry heavier loads, uh, but working around this idea that they have to be made of paper and they have to be, uh, they have to be uh, uh, always propelled by fire. So just to give a general timeline here, okay, they have existed in Brazil for a long time. All right, you see references to them going as far as the early colonial era, okay, when they were launched as part of the Festas Juninas, and also some images here, these um, religious festivities. By the mid 20th century, they start becoming a separate practice on their own, right? They go more secular, they're launched outside of these saints days uh, and start also becoming more popular, right? People start having different kind of themes and shapes start um, growing in some complexity. And by the 1970s and 80, they reached this kind of peak, right? The, 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 they call the golden era of the, of the balloons, where you have um, uh, very, very complex balloons. They become like, that's when you see the emergence of these ballooning teams, right? Uh, the, the, I was mentioning, even have their own uniforms or organized. Uh, they start spreading from where they originate for the most part in, in kind of uh, the suburban uh, neighborhoods of Rio. And they also start growing a lot in size and complexity, which their own success in some ways is also their downfall because by the late 80s and early 90s, they become such a huge, uh, uh, such a huge thing. There's so many of these. Uh, they're big, they carry lots of uh, explosives, as you saw there, or, you know, with thousands of, of, of candles, for example. Um, and because of that, they grow dangerous, right? They can cause forest fires and, and land in the middle of the city. And so by 1988, they're actually, uh, um, after facing some years of backlash, they're actually crim criminalized. Uh, under this um, uh, all-encompassing new uh, environmental legislation package that has one specific provision dedicated to uh, criminalizing the manufacture, possession, or launching of balloons by three years uh, uh, imprisonment, okay? Now, before I go into the kind of broader history here, I will also um, uh, discuss this idea that I bring up there, this concept of insurgent technology, right? It's kind of the term I landed on to describe this particular practice, right? I'm defining it as, and we might see, you know, more details on this uh, article that I had out in, um, 
in uh, early this year in technology and culture. But I define as these technological systems that are created by technicians and inventors at the margins of society. They okay? often in conflict with state authorities or other formal technological systems. Uh, in this case, a lot of industry and infrastructure, uh, uh, the electrical infrastructure and aviation, especially in, in, uh, in Brazil. And they're not unlike the phenomenon that's well studied in, in the history of technology of kind of uh, hobbyist communities that alter and reinvent existing technologies, right? And there's like good studies on this for, for ham radio, for example, right? But they're, in this case, they're also developed, their whole body of knowledge is created and formalized outside of any formal existing technological system, right? They kind of slowly create, like, uh, uh, create and formalize this big body of technical knowledge around this um, on their own, right? And I'll show you part of that process that starts happening in the 1970s. And I hope I'm no longer able to see any of you guys. So I hope you can are actually hearing. I lost my Zoom here. We can hear you. <laughs> OK, let me stop here. All right, good. All right, come back there. So. Let's go back to kind of the traditional kind of smaller practice here. Um, so they're very much associated with these uh, festas juninas, okay? Junina is coming from, from June, uh, you know, uh, winter time in Brazil, right? And uh, there's this festivities that uh, are dedicated to St. Anthony, St. John, and St. Peter. Um, they've existed for a long time. I think in some ways now that people have bonfires, fireworks, traditional foods, uh, these kind of hot alcoholic drinks, right? You have uh, uh, um, mulled wine and uh, uh, cachaça, which is the Brazilian sugar cane liquor, like with spices and, and, uh, and it's, it's a big kind of family celebration. And in some ways it's, it's nostalgic a little bit nowadays because it's 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 you know practice in urban areas right kids in school have these have these parties and they dress up as if they were uh country folk so to speak right so it's almost kind of like a, a projection into into a, a, a pre uh, heavily urbanized brazil and you can kind of see that on this even in this older photo here that you guys are kind of in a uh, doing this like this uh, stereotypical costumes of of uh of rural Brazilians. And one thing they're definitely associated with is balloons, okay? They have always featured balloons and you can see in all these uh, drawings and different depictions of it, there's always little balloons, right? And this is how the practice this existed for centuries was the launching of tiny little lanterns, right? Small balloons, a few sheets of paper folded, uh, uh, with a tiny little torch or candle, something that looks like uh, the ones that you might see in East Asia or Southeast Asia, right? Those festivals where people launch uh, thousands of these small lanterns, right? That's how it had mostly been for, you know, in most of Brazilian history here. Um, and it's, people still launch those, of course, but it is sometime in the mid 20th century that this starts taking a different turn here and people start uh, creating bigger, more complex balloons uh, and start doing it outside of the, the Festa Juninas, right? These festivities here. Now, of course, this, there's a lot of limitation, but in terms of what you can, the, the size and complexity of what you can do in the, the traditional way, which is doing some sheets of paper and getting something like a little bit of a, 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 a cloth or often like um, cardboard egg cartons that people dip, dipped in wax, right? And uh, melt, uh, melted candles and put in there and just launch a small balloon. When people start getting more into this and, and start, doing it outside as its own secular not activity not associated with this is when you start seeing this growing complexity sometime in the 60s but really peaking in what i'm calling here this golden age right uh where people start getting really complex with these balloons so the big feature here is and this is something that is happening in this 
working class neighborhoods outside of Rio and Sao Paulo, right? In the what in Brazil we call the periphery of the city, uh, uh, or um, where there is also space for the practice, right? It's hard to be able to prepare these massive balloons uh, in the, the middle of downtown buildings, right? Or some of these more dense neighborhoods. So as we reach this period here, you see an increasing experimentation. Um, and a lot of this is, is kind of ad hoc little technical innovations, technical and artistic, artistic innovations that start happening from different balloonists that become famous right in these communities uh, because people neighborhood groups that enjoy balloons are starting to like give themselves names right formalizing as teams um, and they keep experimenting and trying to make these larger balloons that run into all sorts of issues so this this period you see also this slow exchange of information that starts formalizing a lot of the techniques that people are coming up with right so one big thing here is that people kept pushing trying to make larger balloons right but the way they craft them where you know there was usually in someone's garage or some workshop right where they glue uh, um, certain vertical slices that form the balloon right they're limited by size right so they people start creating this method of designing them modularly in different uh, in different sections that they can glue together and working out how the design can be done around that. Then of course, as they uh, grow bigger, you start seeing this problem of them ripping apart and too much pressure, right? And then the, the, the paper and glue just not cutting it. So you start seeing someone in Rio that develops this technique of, of, uh, of bending, uh, well, horizontal bending where both, of, whenever there's a, um, the paper and the glue meet, they start putting different forms of rope or strings, more uh, thin rope that goes into the glue and forms this uh, and ties off at the top of the balloon and forms this, uh, essentially this cage, right? So to speak, it's like this uh, uh, wiring inside the, uh, uh, fused into the, the paper that can hold it, right? To stop what they call the, the, what they call black chickens, right? So when a balloon rips and catches on fire and then all the little floating pieces of charred paper, the, they have this length for this, right? They call it black chicken because it looks like feathers, uh, 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 feathers floating around. And you see things like they want them to fly longer as well. So you start seeing the system of multi-stage torches, right? The, 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 the typical torch uh, uh, for balloon here, they will get these big cloth sacks, like the ones for, for coffee, for example. They roll them into logs, right? Dip, uh, uh, melt, uh, paraffin wax and essentially dip soak them in it uh, and make these logs that they pile on on, a, on, a, on this metal frame that holds it in the center, right? And of course, they keep trying to get all sorts of different techniques to get a more even burn that will make the balloon fly for much longer. Um, and in this case, you can see here, one, one of the things they start seeing in the 70s is multi-stage ones where you have uh, fuses that go from the main torch and burn these smaller torches around and slowly kind of have a slow fuse that, that keeps moving the fire from one torch to another to the point that by the late 70s and, and the early 80s, you're seeing balloons that are about 200 feet tall, carry several hundred kilos of fireworks, uh, have you know banners the size of soccer fields and will travel for hours and hours and hours. Um, you know people are following them. It's a big practice, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So the, the chasing of the balloons is a huge thing. Uh, you see uh, people uh, get into caravans of car and drive into the countryside, and with the balloons they start making, sometimes they'll drive for hours. Right? It's kind of a common thing to see in uh, if you go out on on the highway and go towards the countryside. In a, in a winter Sunday morning in Brazil, you might see these groups of cars with guys in uniforms, right? Their balloon team uniforms with binoculars, right? Like searching for different balloons and discussing which one they're chasing. Um, so this, all these different techniques that are kind of showing up, but some of them are, are for making them larger, more powerful, right? Being able to carry bigger payloads to fly longer. Some of them are, are more artistical interventions like these ones where they, they do uh, uh, try to emulate stained glass windows by cutting out each individual little piece of paper 
and gluing them on a thinner, more sheer piece of paper to create this kind of illusion you see there on the balloons on the right. Uh, and it's also when you start seeing those big uh, light panels that I show, right, that are essentially uh, 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 thousands of lanterns forming pixels of an image, right? So uh, just all sorts of little small interventions here. And I can, you know, can talk about how lots of these are made later on. And I'll show you guys a little video clip from this documentary uh, uh, that I made that uh, 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 Bruce mentioned in the beginning there uh, to show a little bit of what a workshop looks like. But the point is that you see was the formation of this, this, this growing complexity, but also this exchange in technical knowledge that is happening. Uh, so people, and a lot of this happens because of the balloons themselves at first, right? Like I said, people love chasing balloons. They'll chase balloons. They'll capture, you know, this really big balloon that has some different uh, system, right? Uh, and they'll meet also the creators of the balloon. They're also chasing them and start, you know, meeting on Sundays for beer, form new teams, right? Have their family barbecues, talk balloon, they're always talking balloons, you know? And do you see this kind of trading techniques, right? Uh, where people um, uh, start learning from each other through these neighborhoods. Now, what happens also is that this starts formalizing through the publication of newsletters, especially kind of your journals uh, for, for balloonists, right? And I have a sample here from the uh, early 90s. Excuse me. But this is happening uh, already in the early 80s. And these are very interesting sources here uh, because they, they have little social columns that have uh, opinion pages. They're discussing, you know, uh, different techniques and what's better, uh, how to space the, you know, best, best methods for spacing the breathing holes where the fumes can come out and different ways to create the big uh, uh, truss structures that hold those banners flat open. Uh, but you also see kind of uh, critiques, right, uh, uh, of balloons. You see announcements inviting people for festivals. This is kind of also a time when you see start seeing these large festivals where dozens of teams will get together and uh, to uh, in a big event and launch, you know, uh, sometimes ranging from small to large hundreds of balloons uh, in the same evening or same morning, uh, but also this kind of more specific uh, uh, technical information. You see the table on the um, on the left here, right? That is uh, that is uh, the uh, measurements to create a particular mold for a balloon, right? How do you draw? two-dimensionally to get the three-dimensional shape, right? So people start getting more complex shapes that they do. Uh, and there's there's several ones. There's the one that you think uh, they call a, a through feed, the one you, that is what you would think is a hot air balloon traditionally, right? With a flat top that is better for lift, right? So people that are launching things that will carry lots of fireworks tend to favor that. Others that look like a toy top, right? They have the small uh, 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 dome. Uh, they have the ones that they call Baghdad, that have a kind of a, a pointy top that resembles a, a minaret, right, from a mosque, that hence why they're calling, uh, they call them Baghdad, <laughs> kind of this um, uh, exoticizing uh, idea that they have. And you see here, this is like calculate, um, a chart for making a, a Baghdad balloon here, 13 meter, 36 slice uh, Baghdad balloon, right? And so you start seeing these, uh, um, uh, all sorts of kind of uh, how to calculate um, uh, how to calculate the, the maximum payload of a balloon, right? All these kind of formalizing bits of technical knowledge that start building on themselves and start becoming kind of a baseline uh, body of knowledge that people have to be aware of to start getting into ballooning, right? Um, of course, this is, and I can talk a little bit more about this later, eventually in the 90s goes into the internet where you start having databases of modes and, and uh, people put up little webs, uh, websites for the formulas to calculate the payloads and all sorts of different kinds of techniques. But this is not just all technical, it's formation of a larger community, right? There's social aspects to it, start bleeding into popular culture, right? Uh, um, you can see here, they start to, in the 80s, you start seeing 
uh, kids' books about balloons, but also these collectibles, right? I think the equivalent in the, in the US are baseball trading cards. I don't know if it's the same here where you, you actually have like a book that they have the slots that you have to glue in each one to complete your collection. In Brazil, we have those for soccer, but by this time you start seeing them for balloons, right? You start uh, every year, they'll, they'll launch a new uh, co co um, card collection for balloons where people can go and, and try to complete the collection of all the top balloons of the year, right? Fill, fill in their book, as they seem on the right here. These are all uh, cards that the kids collect and, and, and glue onto their books, right? And you still, I mean, if you go into the, the Brazilian equivalent of eBay today, these are still kind of a, a hot commodity among some collectors, right? Some of the rare balloons, the, um, uh, the, the teams compile, uh, of course, albums of their own work, which they call balloonographies. Uh, and you see they'll have photos for each one and they list them by, uh, and you see here, uh, the captions are such and such team, uh, how many meters, often if it's okay, if it's a fireworks or a banner balloon, uh, if it's a, a night or daytime balloon, right? So they start compiling these, uh, what also eventually become internet databases, right? Collections of these, these um, uh, uh, balloonographies, right? And, and and different kind of technical information. I actually went to check. There's a couple of these uh, newsletters uh, that have evolved and uh, still exists as websites. There are kind of compendiums of different kinds of information, opinion columns by different balloonists on, on techniques and, and kind of artistic trends. Um, and it's, it's funny because I actually went to check this morning. It, like I said, they've been illegal since uh, 1998. Uh, and I see that actually the main one is actually currently down. Uh, and I just saw this morning, I'm not sure if they were shut down because it's ballooning content. Thankfully, uh, I have been, I've been uh, patiently every once in a while when I think of it, going to archive.org and the internet archive and making sure to, uh, that the internet archive is preserving some copies of this for potential, you know, uh, for preservation and uh, potential future research. Um, and they have also, I mean, like uh, decades worth of photos kind of organized by, uh, it's, it's, it's a big archive essentially here. Now, what you also see is that people start noticing them, right? As they grow larger, they're flying longer, they're coming out of their neighborhoods and they're flying sometimes into the countryside, but well, sometimes they're also flying into the more, uh, um, uh, into the downtown of the cities, right? There are middle-class people that live in the center and more uh, wealthier people also that live in the center of the city obviously start taking notice because if you wake up on Sunday morning with a gigantic pyrotechnical show above you and look outside and see this elaborate gigantic balloon, <laughs> it's hard to miss, right? Especially when you, you, you see, you know, several of them uh, go over your house in, in one day, right? So of course, as um, other people outside of this community start taking notice, you start seeing some writing about it. And this is kind of one famous article that kind of launches um, uh, kind of uh, first big look inside the, the world of balloonists um, uh, from uh, 1979 here. It's a lengthy article talking about, uh, you know, this journalist goes and, and attends some launches and starts talking uh, telling people, right, that don't live in these neighborhoods about the, the internal culture, right, the teams, the, the kind of parties that launches. Now, you see the, 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 in the article here, it says that the, the subtitle there is the, the forbidden stars of the real skies. Now, here's the thing, I, I talked about them being criminalized in 1998, but they had technically always been illegal, just was never enforced, right? And you can see um, even there's um, from the late colonial era into the Brazilian empire, was just for background for people with Brazil is one of the few countries that became, uh, well, only country in the Americas that became independent to become a monarchy. So from 1822, uh, Brazilian independence until 1889, Brazil is a, is a monarchy. And throughout this whole period, you see laws, repeated laws forbidding 
large balloons, right, over concern about fires, which of course to me indicates that because new laws keep getting written, also indicates that they were not being followed, right? The balloons kept going up, and we know that from, from the record in general. <clears throat> and uh, it was, it's, so it's interesting here to see, well, why, right? Why, why they're not? And this, actually, this newspaper article um, gets into something interesting. So from, the 19, uh, from 1964 to 1985, Brazil was run by a military dictatorship. Right, and there was lots of uh, uh, political repression, torture, execution, censorship, right? But you have, and, and of, of course, a big, you know, uh, uh, law and order agenda, right? But none of these balloons are repressed, and they're, you know, very prominent. And actually, there is uh, in this article, they start talking about how there's some important people that really enjoy them. Right, so for instance, there's a, um, a police chief from the Department of Order, uh, Political and Social Order, which is the sphere agency in the Brazilian military dictatorship responsible for a lot of this political expression, uh, sorry, repression. And they're interviewed and they say, it's like, well, you know, is there anyone that thinks the balloons are immoral, right? I mean, they're, they're considering we have these uh, uh, leftist and counterculture that we're trying to suppress. This is something kind of wholesome, right, and, and traditional of Brazilian culture, right? Um, and you see this even from one of the, the, the military presidents who came, um, who was from Rio, actually like receives cards, like Christmas cards from a famous Rio balloonist, right, showing what they launched that year. And we have the letters like in the presidential stationery uh, written back to him you know, congratulating him on the balloons, right? So there's this kind of idea that this is a, a, a kind of traditional, wholesome Brazilian culture, right? That serves as a, as a counterpoint perhaps of the, the kind of uh, more uh, considered immoral by the dictatorship counterculture that might be uh, uh, spreading some perhaps downtown middle-class areas, right? Of these two cities, right? Where, where balloons are prominent. So you start seeing lots of, positive, some mostly positive press about them, right? As people are starting to see this new interesting colorful world, right? In these new newspaper articles, there is a kind of, this is the first time you also see, you see an anthropologist write a book about the culture of ballooning. It's actually the only really academic publication that was written about them over, over the decades, uh, a major one. You see, for example, in, uh, in Sao Paulo, the, 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 um, uh, sorry, the state uh, kind of cultural agency, right? Sorry, the city's uh, uh, cultural ministry um, actually hosting a big exhibition inside this uh, cultural space of a big warehouse where they, they feature balloons and they invite the balloonists to be curators, right? And they keep these balloons inflated inside a warehouse with electrical fans uh, and have the balloonists talking about them there, kind of, you know, sharing their, sharing their knowledge about them. Of course, as they really grow, right, and become way too numerous, things start going the other way, right? And perhaps most symbolic of this is the fact that this very cultural center that hosted this balloon exhibition uh, in the 80s, uh, in 1981, was burned down in 2007 because of a balloon launch, uh, landed on its roof, right? And the place caught on fire and burned this uh, culture institution and library, right? So I think it's kind of the, the perfect like arc here that we can uh, show, you know, like the evolution of what happens because they start, it's, it's, it's kind of, the, their success creates their own downfall here because as all these techniques are formalized, Right, and you have these newsletters that teach people how to make balloons and do the proper calculations and different materials and techniques. Right, at this point, by the late 80s, you have uh, stores that are specialized in balloons. Right, it's like uh, places where people can go buy the different kinds of paper and firework and wire and fuses. Uh, people can kind of talk shop and trade techniques. You have uh, um, uh, photography shops specializing in balloons, like uh, photographers that only do balloon photography, right? And sell albums and things in their stores, right? It's really kind of formalized to an extent that it's a lot easier for 
anyone, not just anyone, right? But for people to get into the practice, right? And start making pretty complex, large balloons. So you see this kind of turn towards a negative view of, view of, of the balloons emerging in the late 80s and early 90s, even within the balloonist community, right? In these newsletters that are showing, they start talking about this younger generation that's coming along and being irresponsible, right? Oh, they just make these gigantic balloons, overload them with fireworks. You know, sometimes they're not even, they're not even really off the ground and they start, uh, uh, you know, shooting off their fireworks, injuring people, and they're not calculating things properly. They just, uh, uh, to make sure it clears the city, they just want to overload too many fireworks. Um, and uh, you start seeing this older generation critique a new generation that is using the formalized knowledge they created kind of irresponsibly in their view. Uh, and for background, this is also a really unstable time in Brazil, right? This is a time of like great uh, um, economic problems, like uh, hyperinflation, uh, lots of crime. Uh, so you start seeing also like as this community becomes uh, larger, it becomes more anonymous and you start seeing kinds of uh, conflicts, right? I talked about how chasing balloons is a, a big activity. Actually, there's teams that are just dedicated to that. Uh, they're like specialized in chasing balloons. They like look at wind forecasts, uh, do all sorts of planning, and they capture the balloons, right? Or refurbish them a little bit if needed and launch them again. But there's this whole culture around it. Like if a balloon lands somewhere around Sao Paulo, Rio, there will be people under it. There will be dozens and dozens of people chasing them from different teams right and there were some uh, like code of conduct right some kind of honor codes around this where there were some rules right the first person to touch the rim of the balloon right the metal structure that goes under it gets to keep it and relaunch it right or if people have to collaborate to to be able to uh, 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 successfully capture the balloon they will you know either trade balloons or do a joint launch but as this becomes during a, a time of violence, right, and crime and, and economic issues, this community is also becoming large and anonymous. You start seeing violent conflicts, right? You start seeing people pulling out guns uh, uh, when they they meet under a balloon that they're chasing. And you see in these balloon newsletters critiques of these, right? You see these people that have kind of like uh, become the the senior balloonists, right, who publish these things and kind of are, are they the the keepers of this like. Uh, formalized body of knowledge, criticizing uh, uh, criticizing this new culture and saying it makes us look bad, right? Um, so you start seeing more and more people complaining about balloons, right? They're causing fires, right? Uh, you start seeing uh, uh, letters written to local newspapers where people are like, "Well, a balloon launched on you know fell on my street, and these people you know climbed on my roof to get it, and they you know uh, broke my the, my roof tiling." Uh, and uh, uh, the power went out for an hour in my city. And you've seen that this is like even one, I think like uh, captures the kind of midway through the transition. I saw one example of a letter to the editor uh, in, a, in a small kind of uh, uh, neighborhood for a part of the city, an area of the city of several neighborhoods where someone complained that yeah, our power was out for an hour because the balloon landed and, you know, uh, uh, um, and, uh, on the transmission line. And the, the newspaper editor says, I like, I'm sorry, but uh, honestly, I have to admit, I actually love balloons and think they should continue, <laughs> right? So you start seeing this, this kind of divide growing, right? The, from, from being something, this being a, a relatively unknown subculture, a subculture in the 50s, where people started making these kind of in their modern form to blowing up, you know, in the 70s and 80s to in the 90s, starting slowly seeing as being negative. Which then eventually leads to this law in 1998, right, where you see it being fully criminalized. Like I said, the making, uh, the possession, and launching of balloons uh, uh, being punished by three years in jail, and you start seeing an attempt, of course, to change the culture around it, right? Tell, tell uh, um, uh, children, right, the little leaflets for children given in schools talking about the dangers of balloons. Right, the fact that they could they could uh, uh, cause aviation accidents, they could uh, um, uh, cause forest fires, which actually do aviation accidents, something that hasn't happened, uh, and, and the way it's technically described is a little bit overblown in the sense that 
uh, people describe them as having gas tanks that would explode and so on. And that's not actually something that is done. Uh, but, uh, you know, you start seeing more and more this kind of deployment of, uh, uh, of camp educational campaigns to try to root out, like, from a new generation, right? So, sorry, I, was, I went ahead of myself talking here, but uh, this is the period of from the 80s and 90s, right, where you see this, this uh, kind of increasingly negative uh, uh, view of balloons, including on, on the kind of, uh, we have this lots of these like afternoon TV shows uh, since, uh, in Brazil, uh, they're all about crime, right? It's kind of, uh, it's the kind of uh, tabloid, crime tabloid uh, uh, version of, uh, TV version of a crime tabloid. And by the 90s, you see, just like you would see perhaps in people who live in Los Angeles see police chases, right? Uh, a helicopter, uh, a TV helicopters following, you know, someone, someone in a, a, a high-speed chase on the, on the highway. You start seeing these for balloons, right? You have the TV helicopters chasing these balloons, right? And seeing them land on the city and seeing all the balloonists like wrapping them up and like escaping in motorcycles. Um, and this just, it just goes downhill from there, right? It's, and the part of the problem is the, the kind of actually the, the increasing technical complexity makes them more dangerous, right? Uh, um, as they become heavier as well. And of course they start really, really, but as their numbers grow, I mean, they're really competing with the, uh, uh, with the uh, for airspace and uh, what is a very congested airspace, Sao Paulo and Rio, right? Both of them, like Sao Paulo being, a major hub. Uh, Sao Paulo also, uh, at least as of a couple of years ago, has the largest helicopter fleet and then most, uh, the largest number of flights per hour of helicopters, right? It's a very traffic congested city, has crime problems. So a lot of its wealthy residents commute by helicopter. And you can see this phenomenon actually uh, through, um, uh, air traffic control radio recordings. There's, there's several communities uh, online that, you know, uh, uh, follow, you know, just like ham radio enthusiasts, for example, they'll, they'll follow air traffic control, right? Listen in, record it, um, and they will, you know, post uh, dangerous or funny incidents in, in, uh, in air traffic control communications, right? And you can find several of them from Brazil discussing balloons right and then i kind of uh, there's one main one i focused on where it's 20 minute recording where just pilot after pilot reporting different balloons at different altitudes and air traffic control getting exasperated rerouting airline one airline there one way rewriting and another flight another way at some point they, they can see they start uh, there's a difference between the brazilian pilots that know what's going on and just like casually reporting it's like well yeah i have a big one, this type of balloon, you know, they kind of like relatively familiar with, with, with it, saying at, you know, at my three o'clock, uh, 10,000 feet, um, and the uh, air traffic controls is like reroute as needed. Like you have the airspace, <laughs> do what you gotta do. And you see foreign air, uh, airline pilots are not familiar with this, uh, uh, being somewhat exasperated. It's like, what is, what is going on here? Why are these being permitted? You know, like, well, well, you know, there's some event I missed here. There was no, you know, notification on, on my uh, on my briefing about this balloon event that is happening or something of this sort, right? <laughs> kind of uh, unfamiliar with it. It's become a big issue for aviation recently, uh, including the fact that, you know, uh, Brazilian airspace was downgraded, uh, uh, which has insurance implications for airlines. Uh, and, and, you know, the uh, International Association of, of um, uh, Air Transport Pilots, uh, you know, riding letters to the Brazilian Defense Ministry asking that something be done about this, right? There haven't been any direct incidents, but if you listen to these air traffic, um, uh, traffic control communications, you see that obviously they're dealing with it regularly, right? Where they're having to fly around these balloons, right? They're kind of competing for the airspace. So by the late 90s, when balloons are criminalized, this community has become pretty well isolated. There's lots of people have uh, uh, have negative view of them. People, there's no neutral view of balloons. There's either people who are from 
these neighborhoods, right, and the kind of margins of the city, they're into it. There's the balloon teams, they're kind of again, mostly underground, right? They're very secretive now. Um, and you have most everyone that's not, you know, somehow involved, uh, thinking it's kind of a barbaric, dangerous practice, right? And like I said, you see it on TV in the way that, um, in the way that, uh, you know, it's reported in crime tabloids, for example. Um, and you also see in the way that the police <laughs> react to it. Uh, you kind of see a lot of these in the, in the newspapers where they, you know, uh, raid a balloonist workshop and they would lay out like paper and glue and string and fireworks on a table in the same way that they do for drug raids, where they'll put the, you know, bales of drugs and cash and guns laid out, you know, to give a press conference. They do the same thing with all these these kind of like paper glue and, you know, seemingly, uh, seemingly harmless, you know, uh, items that they display in, in that way. Um, and of course, uh, sorry, I meant to show this earlier here, but like they even employing uh, um, famous uh, uh, children's uh, cartoon characters, right, to make these booklets about the dangers of balloons uh, uh, to try to prevent, uh, you know, children from getting into it, like uh, getting into it, which of course, most people getting into it now are within the within the communities that make balloons, right? So there's this this divide here that reflects a social economic divide, right? People from the cent wealthier center area of the cities that see this as a some kind of barbaric practice, and people from these neighborhoods that are isolated from all the nicer, you know, uh, uh, things the city has to offer in terms of culture and leisure, right? And see this as their their culture, right, that they, that they have to defend. Now, as, like I said, a lot of over the years, like very few, uh, um, uh, you know, there had always been laws and reinforced. The difference here is the 1998 law is it starts being enforced. And there's a difference, uh, uh, kind of the division in the community in terms of how they respond to this, right? Some are, I mean, everyone's driven underground to a certain extent, right? The workshops are really secretive. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, um, I can talk a little bit more. Maybe I'll just wait do the, for the Q&A uh, here in a second about the research methods around this, because, of course, there's no formal archives about balloons necessarily. I mean, the, of course, press uh, research into you know, media. Uh, a few garage archives, right? Like balloonists were collectors and had albums and all sorts of uh, artifacts that he collected. Uh, but also, like to understand the practice, I had to do a lot of, of, of kind of participant observer ethnography, go to launches, go to workshops, right? Sit there and work with them, like help them glue things and do the kind of some of the repetitive work that happens in these workshops, which are kind of really like a social space, right? They all meet on meet on Sunday to do whatever work and talk and you know have a barbecue after. So what happens is they start seeing people that keep advancing this kind of the, their their techniques in a way to keep doing what they're doing before, making larger, more complex, heavier balloons, right? Uh, that have become more dangerous, right? And you see all sorts of like uh, things on the news. I'm using things like. Uh, I, I talked about the technique of putting strings to help uh, structurally reinforce the balloon. Some start using uh, Kevlar wire, which then you know is causing huge problems for transmission lines. And you see others that try to actually uh, um, bring the balloons back into the mainstream, so to speak, right? And try to work with authority. So there's two move like a, a movement of the eco balloons, right? Fireless balloons. Uh, where they will like fill it with uh, um, hot air, seal it, and then create different methods for keeping a stable altitude. One of them is, is using these uh, water jugs that slowly uh, leak the water out so that they, you know, as the, the hot air cools, the balloon's also getting lighter and maintains things like stable flight. One of them actually worked with the uh, Air Force's uh, uh, Technical Institute to learn how to make really cheap radar reflectors, right, put certain objects that they shape under the balloon to make them more visible by uh, air traffic control on their uh, radar screens. But there isn't, uh, this is a small minority here, uh, honestly. Uh, some of them have even run for uh, legislatures, right? With the kind of a, 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 a agenda of legalizing, re-legalizing balloons in an organized system, right? Where teams register and, and pay fees and so on. 
but it's it's generally uh, our, um, our, uh, when I was doing the field work, I'll, I'll summarize by uh, what I asked one one of the balloonists I interviewed, and I asked him like what he thought about the eco balloons as they call him, and he uh, the way he put it was uh, it's uh, uh, he used the expletive, but it's he said is a it's like having sex with a condom. That's that's the that's the way he put it. The eighteen year old guy, right, balloonist, like they, this is it's not fun to have these. Uh, balloons that can't have, you know, like massive torches and blow up fireworks and so on, which kind of leads, you know, to, to where we are now where they really have to be secretive, right? When doing this work, any little sound of siren when I uh, hung out with these balloonists in their workshops caused them to close all doors and go silent, right? They're very, uh, 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 very careful about this. Of course, in a lot of the, these neighborhoods, you know, some of the police is also from there. And it, obviously it's not being enforced everywhere because there's still a lot of them. And I'll give you just one example of that to close the, from uh, doing field work, which is one case where I went uh, early in the morning, right? People start prepping the balloons four or five in the morning, right? Get the still airs uh, to make it an easier launch. And there's one case where we, uh, you know, I went to a balloon launch uh, and suddenly hear gunshots and look at this, like the entrance of this property. It was like at a ranch somewhere. Uh, you see a military police officer with a machine gun just shot in the air to get everyone's attention and telling everyone to, you know, uh, 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 put their torches down, you know, these, these uh, uh, propane torches to heat the air inside um, and comes in making, making a big deal. I'm filming it. He points the gun at me and tells me to put the camera down. And then I see three balloonists go and talk to this guy for a few minutes. And then the, the police officer just leaves. So I asked later one of the balloonists in an interview, I was like, well, what happened? You know, did you guys just bribe him? And he's like, well, no, actually the three balloonists that went to talk to him, they're cops. And they said, told him that, hey, we already paid the guys on the other shift. So if you want money, you got to get it from them. <laughs> so just really, uh, 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 you can see, of course, like there's, I met, say what, five, five different balloonists I met a researcher that were actually military police officers. So that also explains a lot of the kind of lack of enforcement in, in several neighborhoods. But I'll stop here. I already went for a long time. I don't want to leave. I know there's, uh, there's a lot here and uh, like, yeah, I would just like to open, uh, open for questions at this point. And I can show some little clips from the documentary in response to some questions here about how these, how these work. But thank you. Yeah, thank you, Felipe. Thank you, thank you, Felipe. Yeah. Uh, round of applause. Um, uh, really, as usual, this stuff is just so fascinating, and I really thank you for sharing it. There's, um, uh, uh, I should say, oh, here. Let me first of all, in the chat, let me share a link to the article of the, that you've, you know, the place where you've written most about this. Um, it's a fantastic article in Technology and Culture. So, congrats on that article that just came out this year. So, still. Congrats in order there. Um, uh, we've got one question in the Q&A. Let me just um, say to folks, you could type a question in the Q&A, but we'd much prefer it. If you want, you can just um, click the oh. raise your, your hand button. Yeah, you can, you can just, yeah, you can click the raise your hand button and I'll allow you to talk. I can um, uh, let everyone just speak. We, we have a, a real informal group here and so I can let you um, talk. Uh, if you just raise the hand button, I'll know to do that. Um, oh yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Let me, um, oh, sorry. Sh should I go ahead and read out loud um, uh, the first question here? Um, uh, let's see, uh, it's from Eric Williams. It's coming from inside the house because Eric's <laughs> in, the other, <laughs> in the other room from me. So he says hello. And uh, great talk, Felipe, thanks so much. The extension of hobbies into the sky in, in the mid century and onward is such an interesting story about people and technology. Etc. In that vein, I was wondering, were there any overlap between the balloonists and other citizen science groups like astronomy clubs or meteorology clubs? You mentioned um, ham radio operators too, of course. Um, and he says, how about parascience clubs like the very vibrant UFO flying saucer clubs in Brazil? Did any balloonists ever engage in hoaxes? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> There's a huge one. There's there's overlaps with other subcultures like kite flying. Like there's not a like they haven't met a balloonist that wasn't a lover of kites, right? And kites uh -huh. are common in, in, in Brazil, like kite flying. Every kid 
flies like high, they have their own actual legal issues because uh, technique that people use there, they use powdered glass and glue uh, on their lines to make their lines sharp. And they fly around other kites to cut their lines and they kind of battle in the sky for that, which has also caused its own different thing of technological back and forth here because this is, as these lines hang over power poles, uh, it had started actually uh, cutting the necks of motorcyclists uh, and killing <laughs> them, which then made that illegal, which then also, it also made, if you've seen Sao Paulo, anyone on a motorcycle, they'll have uh, either one of two things, they have a, a, a strap that clips on their jacket to their helmet to catch lines, or they have antennas, like a radio antenna with a hook that just catches lines that they move ahead. So it's kind of, a, I see a small parallel there and just kind of like a, a hobby getting out of hand, right? And then also like having the, the kind of small bits of, of, of technological change around it. Right. Um, I, think, I, I mean, that, but that's not really what you mean there. I see, uh, not in not in the kind of citizen science way you're talking about. I mean, obviously, they're all into uh, following uh, meteorology, right, and for for practical purposes and knowing local weather patterns and so on. Uh, I do bring up something about though there is like about the UFOs, right? They do actually. Uh, there is <laughs> some balloons have written kind of a. a a very uh, pictorial histories of, of there. There's a few books that were published by balloonists talking about the history of balloons. And I see one interesting conflict, you know, that the famous old book, The Chariots of the Gods, right? Chariots of the Gods, I don't know if, uh, if people mm -hmm. are familiar, right? But make some claims about uh, extraterrestrials helping view the pyramids and so on. And the, and the line, the line drawings in the Nazca Desert, uh, Nazca Desert. And there's actually like a, a, a fight about that with the, with the balloonists who like hate that claim because they're like, no, it's been proven there was pre-Columbian balloonists that <laughs> actually managed, uh, managed wow. to do this, right? There's like people, people like to, to uh, uh, ascribe the origin of balloons to China, but uh, you can see there were uh, all in the Americas, right? In ancient yeah. Americas, there were already balloonists. Right, and that's how they were making these drawings and so on. So you see that there's kind of some engagement in some of these kind of like more uh, exotic, right, uh, uh, things. But it's not there's nothing anything particularly consistent in that, uh, Eric. But but that's interesting because it's a kind of claim about uh, kind of an indigenous technological culture through time, and <laughs> not not ascribing that to aliens, I guess, you know? So yeah, they're like yeah, makes reclaiming sense. the agency there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Too, like, and it matches, yeah, this kind of like processes of, of, of formation of national identity in Latin America, right? Like kind of like, uh, rec like you know, the usage of, of indigeneity, right? As a, as a tool in, in, <laughs> in yeah. like formation of national identity. Yeah. Well, we have another question. Should I read it or do you? I can just respond. I don't know if you wanted to read. Uh, let me read it out loud, just because yeah. um, I'm not. I'm not always sure whether everyone can see. Um, and for the recording, it would help. So, um, okay. So, uh, Professor Seth Garfield says, "Thanks, Felipe. I really enjoyed your talk. I've got some repairs going on at home, so I'll post in chat." Um, a comment and a question. Elite admiration for balloons stems from the fact that it's seen as both traditional, folk, and modern, technological at the same time a recurrent theme in Brazilian nationalism. There's an, and the second paragraph says, there's an element of commercialization here in the popularization of the balloons as evinced by the magazines, but this it was not really developed in the talk which focused more on balloon making as a hobby or insurgent technology. Can you talk more about the financing of these balloons? The funding of by clubs? Is there betting associated with the teens? Is there an informal economy that also contributes to criminalization? Yeah, so um, this finance because this is interesting because it's it's um, the kind of social economic divide here is not pure, it's not really economic one. It's more of a cultural. It is also an economic one, right? But it's it's a cultural one from kind of a more middle class elite culture, right? To what are these kind of more working class neighborhoods that are in the city? Of course, people in abject poverty are not making balloons, right? Well, they are the little ones, but not, you know, not these these balloons. Uh, um, so, but you see, like, uh, um, 
in terms of the composition there, it ranges widely. It's more, it's, it's, it's less about belonging to economic social class and more uh, to belonging of place, right? And culture associated with it. So kind of this one network of balloons that I worked with in Rio and I interviewed and, you know, visited their houses, stayed in their houses to go to, you know, 5 a.m. balloon launches and so on. I saw like a range here, there are two balloonists that work together, right? For example, one guy was really, he was really poor, right? I mean, like in the Brazilian sense of it, it's like, a, you know, like a, a very humble house, uh, you know, with no flooring. And he just had like a little shack he made in the back of the house uh, that was ostensibly for or kite making. He was a competitive kite maker and had trophies and so on. This is a common practice now is to make kite workshops as a disguise for balloon workshops, right? Because, uh, uh, because well, paper, all sorts of the same materials, so you can stockpile a lot of the balloon stuff for kites, right? Uh, uh, ostensibly for kites. And his other friend that I went, you know, that works with them on balloons that I went to visit in the same neighborhood was a civil engineer that was currently working on a contract for the new, uh, uh, um, the new port for the Brazilian Navy submarines, right? And it was obviously much more wealthy, but lived around the same area, right? And helped finance a lot of the like uh, balloons for these local teams, right? Of course, people pay dues and they do what they can. Some people work, put more labor, some people put more money, right? But it's not that, it's not a, it's like a, there's no, you can't paint with a broad brush here, uh, so, so to speak, right? And who they are. Right, this guy, the engineer, for example, I mean, he was showing me his like AutoCAD sketches for balloons and different formulas he has, right? And kind of very, he had, he had a custom cabinets built uh, through his entire home workshop with like the, the sliding drawers that are the perfect size for the kinds of paper they buy and all sorts of things, right? But that gets to the, the commercialization really, sorry, which is kind of more the part of the, the, the question here, right? Like, so in terms of the teams, People pay dues, they do what they can. There's some wealthier people that maybe are doing sometimes less of the labor, but putting in more of the money, right? Um, uh, because also generally young, younger people as well, so they might not have that much money, but they do a lot of funding by uh, uh, commercialization of it. So one big thing I mentioned, the kites, one big thing is balloon teams open actual kite shops like stores, little small storefronts where they sell paper, sell pre-made kites, sell kite lines, that kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, like for, you know, and which also, there's the other implications here is informal commerce that is often also uh, is criminalized, right? It's not paying taxes, doesn't have the permits and so on. And there's another element here is that this informal commerce is actually also doing things that are supposed to be regulated and they're not falling under that scope. So the selling of fireworks and also the selling of the very legal powdered glass, right? That is used for kites to become cutting kites, essentially, right? So this, much like the informal economy that is criminalized, right? The, 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 as I was mentioning here, where you see the street vendors being cleared out by police in downtown Sao Paulo and Rio often, right? You see these people pack up, or you see a bustling market become a desert in five minutes, right? By people packing up ahead of the police. But you see the same issue here in that the, the, the commerce they used to fund the balloons are, is also often criminalized, right? I, I saw this uh, myself once, not in doing research, as a, as a seven-year-old kid <laughs> in my neighborhood, like the balloon team, Right, had their workshop with someone's garage. They kind of made a little storefront to sell kite materials to make money. And some uh, someone down the street said it was actually oh, a drug dealing spot because kids keep coming in and out. Called the police. I was sitting there. There was a raid. They put us threw us all up against the wall. Like me too, just saying it's searching all of us. And they find a bag that they're like, oh, we got this. Oh, it's cocaine here. They're they're selling cocaine. And turns out it was a uh, powder glass that the, <laughs> the, the cop was about to sample until someone told them, like, you should not sample. <laughs> this will kill you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it is also even the way they raise their money. Yeah, it's all associated with criminality from, of course, uh, uh, it's associated with, with marginal culture, right, by, by a lot of more middle class 
uh, middle class uh, people, right, that don't live in these neighborhoods, right? It's kind of all associated in some way culturally. That seems like a good connection with uh, the next uh, question in the Q&A um, from Marcelo Domingos. Uh, it says, thank you for your talk, Dr. Cruz. Did your article uh, comment on um, balloons and Brazilian culture in terms of festivities? I know at the very beginning you did, but maybe you could speak a little bit more about the connection to um, culture and festivities. I mean, in the traditional sense, it's 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 so yeah, it's so ingrained in the culture, right? Like, I mean, the little festas juninas, right? Those the Catholic festivals in June, there's such a kind of a, a, a you know, what, what, there's no Brazilian child that doesn't have a photo of them dressed up with the little straw hats, you know, like uh, uh, going to these parties and eating the sweets and whatever. They still have fake little balloons in them, right? Like to this day, no matter what the balloonists, these balloonists are, are seeing, that's so well integrated. There's nursery rhymes in Brazil about balloons, right? About balloons falling and chasing balloons. Like it's so, it's so embedded, right? Like in terms of like, centuries of existence right as a tradition um that you know what well, well, we see these kind of like complex balloons right the balloonists uh, that i'm talking about like a, are a divergence right mid 20th century divergence from this tradition that continues right and like launching a, a little balloon is not you know at a at one of these parties not seen really as a big deal right it could be launched like maybe Probably if you're like in a really urban area, it's not as, as, as okay anymore, but generally no one's, you know, kind of, uh, you know, chiding kids for launching a little balloon at a Festa Junina, right? It's kind of such a wholesome childhood thing. It's kind of huh. in, ingrained in the culture, right? Like all, uh, uh, like in, in music, in literature, like balloons are everywhere in that sense, in terms of the more kind of as, a, as traditional culture, right? It's just kind of almost seen a separated Right, they call it the balloon junino, right? Which is the the kind of the the the, the uh, balloon from the festa juninas, the little one that the kids launch, you know, when there are these little parties, versus the ba balloon dos balueiros, like the balloonists' balloons, right? <laughs> that 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 are kind of professionalized balloons, yeah. so to speak. I don't know if that's actually answering your question, <laughs> but it is very much. I mean, like there's there's lullaby, there's like nursery rhymes, right? Little kid songs about balloons, right? They're like traditional, like from you know generations. Felipe? There is even a, sorry, just a popular expression. Oh, Actually, even uh, um, if you say, if you just like brashly like uh, get out of hand and start yelling at someone and get angry, it's called ripping up the balloon's mouth, right? <laughs> it's like a expression because of the kind of also things of people fighting over the balloon, right? When they grab it and like rip it apart. <laughs> sorry, let's go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Felipe, I, what I find really interesting about the whole phenomenon is it's this, you know, a lot of technological innovation, but very constrained, mm -hmm. you know, that, as you said, it's got to be paper, it's got to be fire. Um, and I'm just interested in the dynamics of, of how that constraint is enforced, uh, how that works, and, and what happens if people violate it. Um, I mean, there must be, I'm, I'm guessing there must be somebody who says, well, I'm going to make mine out of plastic, or I'm going to use propane, um, or I'm going to do, you know, something else that's kind of outside the norms. What's the, what's the sort of commentary? What's the response? And what do you think is the interaction between innovation and constraint in this technology? It's, it's a big source of debate, right, from those early, early, like, uh, newsletters and so on to you want to see a good fight on Facebook, go to on these Brazilian like face, balloon Facebook groups and see people getting into this about like using something else. Mm -hmm. like, besides the regular technicals, like what's the better way of, of doing something? But yeah, it is, it is a strange constraint because I mean, it, it's, it's very traditionalist, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, no, this is kind of like the balloon of our childhood, Festa Junina, right? This is the essence. Like the, the idea that paper and paper and fire are the soul of the balloon, and people use. I mean, they will like they will use Kevlar wire to reinforce the paper, and they will use you know like uh, uh, um, uh, carbon fiber rods to lighten the structures that hold the banners. 
people put like radio transmitters to track them. Uh, I mean, like, uh, you know, like people adapt boats to be able to chase them on water and capture them without them getting wet, like with all these like bamboos sticking out around these boats, like they have special, you know, like holders on them. I mean, like there's actually even someone who did use propane. I mean, people use the propane torches to inflate them on the ground, right? And they have this specific torches for them. But one person, like in terms of these debates, like what you're getting at here, one person, some guy in the 80s, I think, actually launched a propane powered balloon, right? He put a tank, just put the torch, welded it right, put on that metal structure there. And he is reviled by the entire community for nowadays for one main thing that one photo of a balloon with a propane tank is used on the kind of what they would call the anti-balloon propaganda by saying that all balloons have propane tanks in them and that's why they will explode an airliner right mm -hmm. and then of course you see all these write-ups by balloonists writing articles and their op-eds saying explain it's like it's mostly paper probably nothing would happen if an airplane hit one you just like you know uh, rip apart and so on so but yeah it's the same thing with the eco balloons right so people think like well that's not a balloon right that's whatever you're making but it's not a balloon <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, uh most people agree on this right people see people will do something different but people see it as a as a, as a funny novelty Right, mm -hmm. not as establishment. Anything that breaks the paper and fire, uh, 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 like essence, it seems like an experimental oddity, right? And nothing that anyone pursues down the line. It's, mm -hmm. It is, uh, I mean, I'm not actually answering your question, am I? I mean, you're saying well, like- well, No, I, I, I think you are, but I think there's, it's a, it's a real interesting, I think very general point of the interaction between constraints on technological innovation and, and innovation within those constraints, you know? Um, and so it's not like the aim is just to make the biggest balloon anyone possibly could. It's to make the biggest, fanciest balloon under these constraints. Right. And I think that in a lot of ways leads to more creativity in a lot of technologies and a lot of other fields. It's like, you know, to take what might seem like a strange comparison, it's like writing a sonnet. You write a sonnet, it has to follow this for everything. But, you know, that's that makes it more, in a, in a way, more creative. Um, yeah. Which um, makes me think that it couldn't, it, you could actually find some way to integrate making them safer as a constraint that fosters creativity <laughs> and moves the, you know, allows coexistence here. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, yeah like, it's it's kind of what are the motivations of the, of, of the guys doing this? That's another little point, right? <laughs> yeah. Are there right. any yeah. women who ever do this? Very gendered. Yeah, which I talk about in the part, article and yeah. didn't get here, but it's super hyper masculinized yeah. culture. Like, hence my joke about the what, what the guy said, what he yeah, thought about yeah, yeah. eco balloons. Like, it's definitely very, very uh, uh, super, you know, hyper masculine culture. Never met, never found a single reference really to any women being in teams or making balloons, other than the occasional reference of balloon is saying, Oh, my grandma taught me to make a balloon when I made one for school, Professor Janina. Like, you know, help me make one of those little ones that I could take to school. It's the only reference I ever hear that mentioned woman and balloon in the same sentence are that yeah. or the more common thing seen in field work which is the young guys like uh joking about the family conflict of this like uh, there's, yeah. they make cartoons and stuff about like like oh you know the wife thinks i'm spending too much time with balloons right oh <laughs> the, you know this kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. traditional kind of jokes about it uh, but the thing you're saying too about the, the the technological constraint it gets to something else that I think is like kind of why I actually say it's like worth kind of considering this as, as a concept is because A, there's methodological implications and how you kind of uncover these, right? In this case, for me, was having to do this more kind of ethnographic type work. Mm -hmm. But they have a self imposed constraint, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But what I think is fascinating too is just thinking in general also of kind of like these more. Uh, 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 the creativity, right? The technical creativity that comes out of, of uh, out of regular socioeconomic or, or structural mm -hmm. constraints, right? Mm -hmm. That certain that certain communities you have. I mean, kind of can start thinking about guerrilla warfare, right? And the creativity in methods and the creation of weapons, right? <laughs> with 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 other technological systems. The great example, of course, is 
to me is like Cuban mechanics, right? Yeah. Like people are, you Those know. Those cars running. Oh yeah, or like taking refrigerator compressors to run motorcycles, that kind of thing, right? That's like what I'm interested in conceptually from this research mm -hmm. is that, right? The kind of te technical innovation that comes from, con from constraints, right? This yeah. kind of like technology from below or the alternative paths it takes, right? The fact that like some places that are like less economically developed have better solutions for certain problems, mm -hmm. right? From coming being second right yeah. in technology and and kind of doing it doing it a better way in the first place right the fact that you can in several portions of rural africa make quick payments through text message right mm -hmm. and we hear you know whatever now we have venmo but before that they were already before the people mm -hmm. had an easier one here people already doing that there right it's kind of yeah. like what what the constraints like lead to in terms of technical innovation right creativity that part's fascinating yeah. to me I think another example, you mentioned ham radio as, as being a sort of technology people have looked at, a sort of a hobbyist one. They were given what was considered the crap part of the radio spectrum. This is back in the 19 teens and 20s. That is like, that's why, you know, the short waves, those are not worth anything. We'll let the amateurs use them. They start playing around with those and find out that they're actually much, much better um, than for all sorts of things than the long waves that were used for you know, long distance wireless uh, telegraphy before. So I think it was really the constraints of being given something that's, you know, being given something that's considered worthless um, and then working with that. And, and it turns out to be even more valuable. I mean, it's a little different kind of constraints with the balloonist, but I think that whole thing of, of how constraints can sometimes prompt uh, greater creativity, I think is, a, is a, an important theme in, in a lot of this. I think like create technical creativity around like uh, economic constraint is like a huge point of pride in Brazilian identity. Yeah. There's a word for this, like gambiarra, which is like, I forgot there's like whatever it's rigging or something of the yeah. sort in Brazil. Like you can see there's like online communities dedicated sharing photos of people doing whatever, using this like, you know, steel wool to, it's a stereotypical thing, like using uh, steel wool for cleaning on your TV antenna to make it work is like the stereotype of a Gambia, uh, right? This thing, like you can see online a lot of like communities dedicated sharing photos of people doing, you know, <laughs> like getting around their economic constraints. <laughs> it's like a point of pride, right? So I think there's a little bit of this kind of like, oh, like a Brazilian will get an and like MacGyver themselves out of anything, yeah, yeah. like kind of like a point well, of pride. And, <laughs> and the term that would be used for it now is a hack, you know? Yeah. Would be a hack, yeah. which <laughs> is there, hack. you back to your title there. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, borrowing that. Yeah. I was wondering if you could, I, I want to make sure you talk a little bit about your your um, research methods for this, especially because we're aiming for this semester to, you know, uh, help out our current grad students. And um, and this, you know, you, both, both how you, um, you talked a little bit about the participant observer kind of aspect, but you have these really cool ephemeral ephemeral documents that you use too and then these you know parts of the internet where this stuff is circulated um but also the fact that you use documentary film um i think is is interesting so i don't know if you want to speak a little bit about your methods for this project yeah i mean this one that out of necessity requires right <laughs> I was seeing a connection there yeah your hack huh? yes yeah and then, um I mean, you, you refer to a graduate student, so I'll, 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 I guess maybe a word some of it is, is uh, some of it as advice, but I don't mean to like in a, in a patronizing way or anything, but like, uh, I think it's, it's important to like shed any prejudices you have about what an archive is or isn't, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I joke about uh, garage archives that are literally like what a, what a, like a, my main archives, other, you know, other, whatever the more ethnographic type uh, uh, research were garage archives because I could find newspaper articles about this but like I said these are all from a, like an external culture right looking at like this exotic right like uh, you know outside of the city there you know um, so it's, it's like the these new newsletters that's I mean, they're like little mimeograph type written things. I mean, this is only from finding these like balloonists that like were collectors as well, right? So 
like even getting there, right? Like this is strict. I mean, like I, I kind of I talked about I talk about with guide students about this kind of stuff a lot nowadays, which is kind of be creative beyond like you look for your libraries and archives and cons you know consult your your indices and so on. But do actually reach out to Harvey. And I'm not just talking about like a, a contemporary thing because there's you know people that are communities of hobbyists and, and uh, people who are interested in things that are you know no longer common practice, right? But talk to the amateur collectors, find that weird side of the road museum, right? Like I love all side of the road museums for this right people are very right people people have it as a passion right they can be super helpful in terms of like finding things that would be otherwise impossible to find like most of the stuff that i found in like just a couple of people's garages there's no way that would have ever been preserved right i was actually trying to work with one of them to actually formally maybe preserve it in some other way right because his sons are not interested in ballooning so i don't know what happens with those boxes um so like finding the odd little collectors museums and so on are actually like, you know, always step back like uh, uh, from like just thinking of the, your, your formal archives, find the, find the weird online communities, find the whatever the Facebook group, the subreddit, the forum, the, you know, like the, the mailing list for, for something and start just politely asking about it people that are into something they do want to they're yeah. like i mean like there was this weird dynamic here because there was there was this dynamic of like oh there's an academic wanting to write about this there's like some form of validation in this space right because it was criminalized and so on so like especially because it's coming from the us it's like open arms like here stay in my house take out all the boxes, go through them, <laughs> photograph everything you want. Here, let's have barbecue, you know? <laughs> um, so, sorry, I'm kind of getting off sidetrack here. Yeah. So I think, I mean, just, yeah, just like non-traditional archives. Like I, I often give this advice, people getting into subjects that are not well represented in formal, in formal archives is find, find hobbyist communities, reach out post on an online forum and saying I'm getting into this. Like, does anyone know anything about this or want to talk to me, right? This, that's how I started this one. I found a couple of famous balloonists, found the one guy who did, the one guy with the major garage archive had published a book, right? Um, and reached out, started reaching out to people in forums and, and asked them if I could, you know, for their email address, email to start calling, uh, used bookstores, at least for Brazil's really important place. For research because then you can actually find some of these old like trading card albums mm. the the books that this guy published are not to be found in it they have been out of print since the 80s right so like little bookshops you know kind of use bookshops are important for me that depends a lot in, in context i mean well, what and where you're researching um but yeah you know because once you get into a network through meeting some of these people then you're in a network that people can point to other people right and you can mm. see you know, you just have to be careful about uh, the more anthropological, I think, like the side of it, the anthropologists be wary of is what is being filtered, right? <laughs> like what is like how the, the self-representation is being made. And also, for instance, for my case, my main entry point is really famous, you know, this famous balloonist that had this kind of big garage archive. He had, uh, he was a traditionalist and hated all these guys that made new types of designs and so on. So he also like couldn't get me in touch with those right i had to like go another way through like facebook groups and find like uh, start posting in, in message boards and stuff the guys were posting these photos of their balloons that were a completely different kind that this traditionalist hates right so it's right. complicated mm -hmm. but but i'll summarize that by like go to side of the road museums use bookstores and find people obsessed with <laughs> obvious <laughs> communities and talk to them because they want to talk about it and might have ephemera that you would be, yeah. you know, and, doesn't exist anywhere. And that then they can use your your tool for uh, scanning uh, archives, right? Yeah, the whole thing you develop there. <laughs> Take yeah. it out of the field and zap, zap, zap. Uh, yeah, making that working on a little uh, device for digitizing archives that is inspired by this guy's garage archive so to speak 
is a small Raspberry Pi computer camera based little uh, 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 system to run run off the grid and, and digitize archives um, mm -hmm. with little 3D printed uh, system for deploying them for for thing, which is why I'm in my home lab today. That's all the 3D printing filament here, <laughs> yeah. running prototypes on the other side there. <laughs> Hacking archives under various constraints. No. I think we're always impressed by that. We sh we're at 1.30, so we should probably yeah, close probably. up shop. I'll wrap it up, wrap it up. So, Thanks a lot, Felipe. That really, was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so, so much. To see everyone. Always great to talk to you and looking forward to your book. So thank you. <laughs> right. Have a great one. Have a good one, okay. everyone. Thank you. Bye, Felipe. Good to see Bye. you. Bye-bye. Good to see you.